Hi there, everyone. My name is Afik Abdelhamid, and I recently completed my master's with Auckland University of Technology at the Institute of Radio Astronomy and Space Research, where the title of my thesis was a study of birefringent scintillation towards the millisecond pulsar J0437-4715. Now, upon encountering that title, you might be wondering three things. That is, what is birefringence, what is scintillation, and what is a pulsar? And to those three questions, I will answer the last one first. Pulsars are neutron stars created when stars 10 to 20 times more massive than the sun reach the end of their lives. They explode as supernova, leaving behind this ultra-dense core with a co-rotating magnetic field. They emit beams of radiation that sweep across our line of sight where they appear as precise and periodic flashes of radio light. Um, they are useful in many ways. Their precise clock-like nature can be used to calibrate local atomic clocks, and they can be used as navigation beacons to localize interplanetary spacecraft to within 20 kilometers in space. And uh, there's this grand global scientific experiment happening right now called the Pulsar Timing Array that seeks to use an ensemble of millisecond pulsars to detect gravitational waves. Now, you might recall this famous image produced in 2019 of the supermassive black hole. Somewhere in the universe, a pair of these monsters are in spiraling and merging into each other. And as they are merging, they are emitting gravitational ripples that propagate throughout the universe, uh, very subtly stretching and squeezing space as they go. And this alters the distance between us and the pulsars, such that if you could imagine these outer points our pulsars and Earth is at the center. Gravitational waves going into this image will stretch and squeeze space in a way that the timing patterns of pulsars separated by 90 degrees will be maximally anti-correlated with each other. And the timing patterns of pulsars along the same line of sight will be more or less correlated. And um, conceptually, it's quite similar to the detection of gravitational waves by LIGO the Light Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory that detected gravitational waves in 2015, except in our case with pulsars, these L-shaped arms go for many light years across the galaxy. And with pulsars, we are sensitive to a different part of the gravitational wave spectrum in the nanohertz compared to the kilohertz of LIGO. Now, that's all well and good, but there is a problem the ionized interstellar medium, the space between the stars is not uh, empty. It is permeated with uh, thermal electrons at about 0 0.1 uh, thermal electrons per cubic centimeter and is also threaded with a diffuse magnetic field and together what make up an interstellar plasma that scatters, diffracts, and refracts the pulsar emission such that an originally coherent uh, and in phase pulse profile becomes scatter broadened in time. And this effect gets worse as you go down to lower frequencies, which is unfortunate because pulsars are brightest at low frequencies where their flux density peaks as shown by the plot on the right. And normally pulsars are timed at frequencies greater than one gigahertz, but as timing precision approaches the nanosecond level, we need to go down to lower frequencies to battle scattering where it is the strongest. So what do we do? Well, that's where I come in with my experiment. I've been analyzing data from the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa in a way that allows us to hopefully probe the properties of the plasma on small scales. And it turns uh, this plasma in the direction towards the pulsar J0437 minus 4715, we'll just call it 0437 from now on, uh, corresponds to a region of space called the local bubble, which is this uh, ellipsoidal shell that encloses our entire solar system and uh, stretches for about uh, 200 parsecs perpendicular to the galactic disk. And, uh, about 60 parsecs parallel to it with a thickness of about 40 parsecs. And the outer and inner boundaries of the local bubble actually play an important role in terms of the scattering that we can resolve in the data. I'll go into that shortly. Uh, now, 
the universe is not static, it is dynamic. The Earth, where the observer is located, the pulsar and the plasma that is modeled as this thin screen containing a spectrum of turbulent structures are all moving. And when the pulsar emission hits the screen, it becomes distorted and wrinkled. And we at the observatory, at the radio telescope, uh, sample a superposition of distorted wave fronts at the receiver, which gives us an interference pattern. And this allows me to answer the second question, which is what is scintillation? Scintillation is simply twinkling. It is the fluctuation of the intensity of light over time. The stars scintillate in the optical light because of a turbulent atmosphere at night and pulsars scintillate in the radio spectrum because of a turbulent interstellar medium. And it is this spectrum of scintillation that gives us the data that I analyze, an example being this um, patches of uh, intensity maxima and intensity minima as a function of frequency and time that you see on the bottom left here called dynamic spectra that are an example of scintillating pulsars observable. Now that uh, plasma screen that I mentioned is a composite of both thermal electrons, Ne, and magnetic fields, B, and together they are birefringent, meaning they have multiple indices of refraction, similar to crystals like uh, calcite, where you have this double refraction effect for an ordinary and extraordinary mode of wave propagation. Uh, the interstellar plasma is birefringent towards left circularly polarized LCP and right circularly polarized RCP emission. Uh, because of these birefringent refractions of the plasma, then one might think that uh, the scintillation patterns of LCP and RCP have some noticeable differences between them with a bright spot in one spectra corresponding to a much dimmer spot or scintle in the other. And this difference should be sensitive to the fluctuation to the fluctuations of magnetic fields and thermal electrons inside the plasma on very small scales uh, given sufficient phase differences between lcp and rcp and uh, some really smart people in 1984 attempted to test this uh, theory and they measured their upper limits to the fluctuations of magnetic fields uh, their well the spatial fluctuations uh, to be about 3.6 micro gauss per centimeter cube. I'll go into that next. So these guys will just call them uh, Simon Eddy Cortez and Spangler SCS 1984. So my experiment is essentially trying to revisit this phenomena with a bit more modern instrumentation, the Meerkat radio telescope uh, with a much wider bandwidth and uh, looking at a much less distant pulsar that is comparatively very bright in flux density, which ended up working against us in the end. Uh, and also with a, a wide scintillation bandwidth, 0437 has. And also we are using different scintillometric imaging and analytical techniques that weren't really explored much in the 1980s, as I'll go into the next sections. But this is really how SES 1984 framed their study. They had this differential phase between RCP and LCP, delta phi, delta beta, and variations of this differential phase causes this exponential decay of this correlation coefficient, gamma RL, uh, between uh, RCP and LCP intensities. So the greater the variance of differential phase the greater the coefficient decays to zero for uncorrelated and one for correlated. Uh, and they would measure gamma RL with this normalized cross covariance, uh, gamma hat RL. And uh, at lag zero, they were able to put that correlation coefficient into this equation to measure this fluctuating spatial fluctuation delta beta. Uh, and they got the upper limit for delta beta for their pulsar was 1.8 kiloparsec. And this Fresnel scale, six times 10 to the 11, and this is really where the magic happens. This is what we mean by small scales, this uh, transverse scale on the scattering screen, which is uh, 
on the order of sub astronomical units, which is pretty small in terms of interstellar medium scales. Uh, a lot of uh, studies where you try to map small scale magnetic fields with, for example, Faraday rotation measure variations usually get a scale between one to 100 parsecs, but this is uh, the Fresnel scale is uh, unique to scintillations. And that's where the novelty of this approach comes in. Uh, 3.6, that's their upper limit, 3.6 for delta beta. And um, delta beta is a composite term of fluctuations from both magnetic fields, delta B, and uh, fluctuations in electron density, delta N E, but they lacked uh, further information on the correlations between delta and E and delta B. So they had to assume um, one was uh, uniform uh, and then assume for an average electron density to measure delta B. And subsequently, if you assume a uniform magnetic field, you can try to come up with an upper limit for uh, delta and E fluctuations in thermal electrons. So there are upper limits for some values of uh, probable values of thermal electrons are about 120 microgauss and uh, 18 microgauss. And yeah, we're really trying to see if we can come up with any better upper limits than this. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And this is our methodology. We form spectra of left circular polarizations and right circular polarizations and subtract them, hoping that the result is some strong differentially scintillating pattern. And if we take the Fourier transform of that differential scintillating pattern, we hope to see uh, parabolic arcs in the secondary spectrum. Now these two have been done before. And I point you to the seminal work of Briskin et al. 2010, uh, where they attempted to do this uh, using VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, uh, towards the Pulsar 0834, uh, which is often studied using the Arecibo telescope. And they did not really find any example of differential scintillation, so which really highlights how small delta beta, I mean, sorry, delta phi delta beta, delta phi RL really is. So we, we need a technique that is sensitive to small angles, small differentials, uh, when delta phi delta beta approaches some really small number. And we're hoping that the secondary cross spectra, which is unique to my study, uh, allows us to directly map the fluctuations of delta phi, delta beta as uh, a function of the delay and Doppler shift of the secondary spectrum. Uh, and this is also something that is a first for uh, my studies. We're taking a cross correlation between the secondary spectrum of LCP and RCP. And hoping that this is the most sensitive way of observing variations of delta phi, delta beta. So to the untrained eye, these scintillation patterns look pretty random and stochastic as if there is no method to their madness. However, if you take their Fourier transform, you start to see this uh, parabolic arc structures, these discrete organized patterns that is uh, indicative of highly anisotropic scattering. It's interferences between scattered images that extend beyond the RMS scattering angle. And what this really means is that there's some uh, organized structure, a highly anisotropic organized structure within the interstellar medium, which runs contrary to this prior theory of um, the Kolmogorov spectrum where everything is isotropic in all directions. So there's, it turns out that the interstellar medium is a lot more clumpy than once previously assumed. And this secondary spectrum analysis by taking the Fourier transform of the dynamic spectrum uh, didn't really come about until the early 2000s when Daniel Steinbring uh, recognized them as a high Q phenomenon. And they were later uh, the theory of parabolic arcs as studied by uh, Mark Walker and uh, Cordes and James Cordes. Uh, 
who outlined uh, who explained their emergence from wave diffraction theory, uh, and I point you to those papers for the full uh, 2004 and 2006 for the full explanation. But in summary, the Fourier transform is able to give us some discrete organized patterns from this chaos from which we can uh, do some serious science from and track structures uh, within the interstellar medium. And uh, that's amazing. Uh, so this is, these are our results. Uh, when we took the difference between oops, LCP and RCP, uh, we saw a lot of noise and we didn't see a lot of uh, scintillating patterns, you no know, uh, islands of uh, intensity maxima and intensity mi minima. We did see some broadband structure. Uh, and then we take the Fourier transform of this uh, and we also saw pretty much a uh, field of noise in the secondary spectrum. And I developed some data reduction code to sample the values along this parabola. And we don't see anything in the ways of like uh, an, an arc where we expect a parabolic arc to appear. And even in the secondary uh, cross spectrum, the imaginary part of which is the phase, the imaginary part of which is delta phi, delta beta, um, we think that we are able to resolve parabolic arcs. However, when we sample along the parabola, we think that the phase variations of um, this secondary cross spectrum is random and stochastic, such that we think it originates from the self noise or the jitter noise of the pulsar that is noise that is intrinsic to the pulsar signal itself which uh, limits uh, a lot of observations uh, it certainly limits observations uh, for limits the precision of pulsar timing it serves as kind of this this wall that you kind of go up against in scintillation terms it's kind of this intermittent emission that gets correlated across the bandwidth it's it's noise of the source itself. So it's somewhat of a null detection. And uh, we conclude by saying that LCP and RCP are highly correlated and that the differential phase is uh, much fainter than the jitter noise or the intermittent emission of intrinsic to the, the pulsar signal itself. So it's, it's difficult to it's buried inside all of that noise and difficult to resolve. So moving onwards, we persisted and we attempted to characterize the noise that we uh, discovered. And we used this normalization of the imaginary part of the secondary cross spectrum um, to come up with upper limits of delta beta the same way that uh, Simon Eddy Cordes SES 1984 attempted, and we found our upper limits of delta beta towards the pulsar uh, 0437 as 185 microgauss per centimeter cube uh, using equation 33 of SES 1984 and using these parameters uh, for the L band of the Meerkat radio telescope, the distance to 0437, and our Fresnel scale which is uh, 1 times 10 to the 11 as centimeters as an estimate. Uh, and since delta beta is a composite value, we can set, for example, uh, delta B here to con no, we can set delta NE to constant. And for a probable value of NE towards 0437, which is about 0 0.017, uh, per centimeter cube, we get delta B upper limit as less than 10 milligauss, uh, which doesn't make much sense. <laughs> and when we set delta B to constant, and for a probable value of this B as for, for micro gauss, which is probable value of interstellar medium, we find fluctuations of NE to be less than 46.1, which is on the same level as an over density within the interstellar medium because there are these things called extreme scattering events where 
there's just an overdense clump of plasma moving across the line of sight. And those are usually hundreds of uh, thermal electrons per centimeter cube. And we got 46.1, so it's almost on the same level of an overdensity as an upper limit. So our upper limits are a bit uh, uninformative towards O437. Uh, however, if we substitute uh, these, um, these frequencies and uh, distances uh, with the ones uh, towards the pulsar 1737, of which SCS 1984 studied, we get more sensible values for delta beta delta B and delta NE. Um, so really the conclusion also is to reobserve other pulsars that are more distant and to reobserve at lower frequencies. We seem to have gone in the opposite direction, but we were really banking on the polarimetric purity of the meerkat uh, and the incredible science that was coming out of the meerkat uh, as of late and thinking that we would be able to simply just take the closest millisecond pulsar and uh, find something interesting in that regards. But I guess a little bit more work needs to be done. Uh, use the same analysis techniques on a more distant pulsar, uh, probably uh, one kiloparsec. Yeah, and at lower frequencies, uh, the Meerkat has a UHF band uh, that has a center frequency of about I think 800 megahertz, um, and maybe even uh, reobserve with different radio telescopes. Uh, the Murchison Wide Field Array comes to mind, uh, LOFAR comes to mind, and hopefully, well, we did through our studies uh, find that the phase of the signal varies uh, a lot smoothly as you approach um, as you approach this inner lower part of this parabola, which was an interesting find. However, it just wasn't as significant as we had thought it would be. So yeah, I'm looking forward to what we see if we reobserve other pulsars uh, and that are more distant at perhaps one kiloparsec distant. Should be interesting. Now this is the Meerkat radio telescope. It will, um, it is a, precursor and a pathfinder, it will one day become part of the square kilometer array, the largest radio telescope in the world. And uh, I'd like to say that even though experiments like mine did not find any evidence of a strong signal, uh, it does uh, function as a test bed to test the sensitivity of um, this future platform uh, of the square kilometer array to see how sensitive the meerkat can be towards small scale variations of interstellar magnetic fields. And of course, uh, it's good proving ground experiment for the square kilometer array. And with all the data that will be processed by the square kilometer array, that's about uh, more data in one hour than the entire internet uh, on several days. <laughs> The square kilometer array will no doubt be able to pioneer and develop uh, processing big data processing techniques that will spin off to enhance the engineering and performance of public data networks, such as the internet that we all know and love. And who doesn't want faster internet? So that's just an aside motivation for why we should do this kind of work why space science matters. You got to sell it to the civilians out there who are actually paying for it and what they get in return. So it's, it isn't just some sort of esoteric uh, space magic <laughs> where we're looking at parabolas and um, scintillation. And yeah, so it'll hopefully one day work out in the end. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you for hearing my story of trying to map out interstellar plasma with radio telescopes. And I hope I can make some follow-up studies soon. Thank you very much.